Hey guys, what's up fam? It's your boy ZDogMD. I'm not sure why I'm talking like Cal. Actually like Cartman making fun of Cal. Uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, today, we are gonna do something a little different um, because I'm gonna talk about something that only I care about, it seems like, but you might care about and you actually should care about because it's probably the only thing that actually matters in the universe, which is what the heck is the nature of reality? And this relates to medicine, it relates to science, it relates to philosophy, it relates to religion. And the reason I started getting into this stuff, and I want you guys to bring your A-game questions, I'm gonna load up your uh, video here on my little iPad so I can see, because I see Marissa's here and Kimberly's here and Ari's here, all kind of fam Tanya's here. So. The reason I got into this is, okay, ever since I was young, I've struggled with the question of, hey, what is reality? I don't understand. The Big Bang happened. You know, my parents are Zoroastrians, which is this ancient religion. I never was religious. It just didn't sit right with me, organized religion. But yet, when I was this hardcore atheist, I didn't, un I, it was this empty philosophy that was just as dogmatic it felt, right? So, you know, I would listen to Sam Harris and, the interesting thing about Sam Harris that got me interested in this stuff more was that here's an atheist who goes hard on religion, but he practices, you know, he's pretty a devout practitioner of meditation and spirituality in general, trying to find out what is the nature of consciousness and our experience minute to minute. So that got me interested. A scientist like Harris could look empirically at issues of spirituality, the whole bigger picture of what what is it, why are we here, who are we, and how can we be better in the universe by understanding the universe better? So this put me on a path of, you know, obviously getting through the whole um, uh, meditation and those kind of things and really empirically looking at my own experience through meditative practice, which is a kind of a scientific pursuit of the mind. Well, um, Relating to all this is all our scientific training, particularly in healthcare, right? So we are um, really conditioned from early on to view the universe through the lens of physicalism. What that means is that, especially as scientists, as many of us are, we are sort of led to believe through the scientific revolution that the nature of the universe is that it is made up of unconscious fundamental matter elements. Whether you go down to the string theory level of vibrating energetic strings at the Planck size, which are really, really, really the tiniest things that we can sort of conceive, all the way up to electrons and atoms and quarks and muons and blah, 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 up to human systems, which are organs and organelles and cells and neurons and electrochemistry, all the way up to galaxies, solar systems, galaxies, planets, and the universe. And the idea that all of this is physical matter that came to be in the Big Bang, grant us that miracle, we don't know how, and has some destiny and is predictable through science. Well, all of this makes perfect sense within a lot of the science that we've discovered over the last few hundred years. And so now you have science, which is materialism, physicalism, atoms, trying to explain how from this three pound mass of goo, the brain, physical goo, emerges consciousness. Now, a lot of us don't think about this on a daily basis. We don't think about the fact that one of the biggest mysteries in the universe is sitting at any given time with us. As I sit in this chair, I am experiencing one of the greatest mysteries in the entire universe, which is how I am experiencing anything at all. How is it that this mass of physical goo has the experience of being able to hear my own voice, of the sound of an airplane overhead, of the frigid cold of my garage in the Bay Area, of the colors and patterns that appear on my phone as I stare at myself in the camera, 
at the weird symbols that I see that make up your comments, like Adam Sturdivant, who says, why do you think so many choose to believe in their own skewed version of reality informed by right-wing propaganda and left-wing propaganda alike? Great question. We might get to that. That is one of the deepest mysteries, how we are conscious at all and how physical matter can emerge consciousness. This is where I went down the rabbit hole of Dr. Donald Hoffman. Donald is a professor of cognitive science at UC Irvine. I did a podcast with him several months ago that's available on my website if you search um, uh, ZDog MD Hoffman, it'll come up. It's an audio only podcast because he was in Irvine. And I recently read his book, which I highly recommend you read, called The Case Against Reality. And in this book, he takes us on this sort of beautiful journey that in the end inverts all our assumptions about what reality is. In his estimation, we have been looking at it completely backwards and we've been fooled into believing that the universe is made of X and that we see it as it is. Whereas in reality, the truth is much more elegant, more unified, more beautiful, and more mind-blowing than anything we might have imagined. So let me take you on this journey. And I, the reason it resonated with me is once I heard the case, I said, this is the only thing that explains the most things in terms of the science and spirituality sort of dualism, which is not a dualism, they are one thing. And actually, science itself does not assume a physical world, it assumes a method of inquiry. And it turns out if Hoffman is right, we can apply that method of inquiry to the nature of reality without having to assume there are physical objects that exist when no one looks at them. Okay, check it. Let's go through this. So, we believe through our own experience that items that we see in the world, like this ZDog MD mug, are actually existing in something called space time. In other words, they exist, they exist in time and space. Einstein coined this space-time idea that space and time are kind of one fabric. And we assume that this mug, which has properties, it's hard, it's a little shiny, it has this crazy colors on it, and it exists in space in front of me. I know this because others agree when they see it, and I agree that I can experience it. And that's one thing that I know must be real, my own experience actually happens to me. I can experience it. So this thing is real in time and space. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because we assume that evolution or God or whatever you believe created our senses and our experience to be what Hoffman calls veridical. That means truthful, that they show us reality as it actually is. It may not show us all of reality, but it shows us enough to allow us to survive. So maybe there's more to this cup than I see. I don't see ultraviolet. I don't see infrared. I don't see quarks and muons at the very small level. I don't see how this is subtly through its gravity bending the fabric of space-time. I don't see that, but it's there. It just means I'm not evolved enough to see it, right? So that is the assumption that most scientists and many philosophers agree on, that we see the world as it is. Scientists who study perception, like Hoffman actually, who's one of them, actually mostly think that our perceptions show us reality as it is, just with distortions. So we have illusions, we have um, uh, misrepresentations, but reality exists in the real world and it's roughly what we're seeing, what most normal people will see. There are people who see it distorted, who have you know faulty perception but everybody else is seeing it accurately. Now, this is the prime assumption that Hoffman initially destroys in his book. And this is how he destroys it. It starts with taking one of the big sort of um, uh, scientific advances, which is evolution. 
So evolution says things compete and they evolve and the fittest survive and natural selection is the pressure that allows fit things to survive and change and evolve over time. What Hoffman and his colleagues did was they looked at uh, evolutionary theory from a mathematical standpoint. And this is sort of well-established math and stuff. And they ran a series of computer simulations where they said, okay, if organisms see reality as it actually is, in other words, you've set up a fake world and you have a bunch of organisms compete with each other. If, they if their perceptions are accurate to what reality really is, in other words, there is a mug, there is an apple, there is food, and it, it looks like that. It actually exists like that in the real world. In other words, there's the perception of it, but there's also the real thing. Well, those things ought to really do well evolutionarily because they're seeing truth, right? But what if the other possibility is that there's a group of organisms in this game that see reality in a series of icons. They see reality not tuned to, to see truth, which can be very complex and very confusing, but tuned instead to see fitness. In other words, if I'm interacting with objective reality, I will only see it dumbed down through a graphical user interface, similar to a computer, that hides reality. Because reality is it's too much. But what I see instead is what I can use, and evolution only cares about what I can use to survive, compete, and reproduce. That's called fitness. So fitness payoffs are things that help me survive, compete, and reproduce. So if this is true, if you run the simulation and there's a group of organisms that see truth, and there's a group of organisms that only see icons that help them reproduce. In other words, truth is entirely hidden, but it's related to fitness. So whatever there is in the real world, if I go get that one thing, or if I go step up to it in my interface and I take it and I put it in my mouth, I do better. I'm more likely to survive. If I have sex with that thing, I'm more likely to reproduce. But I don't see the thing as it is. I only see an icon that helps me reproduce. So no truth, just fitness. Well, guess what? When you run those simulations, no matter how complex they are, no matter how many organisms are involved, truth goes extinct every single time, 100% of the time as you get more complex. Let that sink in. Organisms that see reality as it is go extinct. Organisms that, if they're competing with organisms that see fitness payoffs in the form of icons, that help them reproduce. They do much better and they will destroy organisms that see truth every single time. And this makes intuitive sense because you're dumbing down reality, you're changing it to just be an icon off a cup that represents a fitness payoff for me. What does that mean? It means that if I see this icon on my desktop, which is space and time, if I see this icon, I know certain fitness payoffs. If I can grasp it a certain way, it can be filled with water, I can drink the water, and I can survive. This is a useful icon. I also know that I can manipulate this icon with a ceramics making machine that is another icon. So I can use one icon and combine it with another, similar to a computer desktop, and make the icons change, which now changes my fitness payoff. Well. If you see the world in, the ter in terms of icons, are you seeing the world as it is? No, but you're seeing the world as it pertains to your ability to reproduce. So here's a question, is this true? Does this make any sense in terms of the real world? Um, think about a computer desktop. It's simplified, it's a folder, you can drag it, you can open it, you can tr move it to the trash. All those actions have effects you can delete your work. You can create work and it all works, but are you seeing reality? Oh, hell no, you're not seeing the zeros and ones and voltage gates and, transistor, and transistors that actually run that computer. If you did, you couldn't even write an email. Hoffman proposes that reality is the same. And the theory is called FBT, fitness beats truth. 
That's the theorem that he's mathematically proven with his colleagues. From that theorem that organisms see fitness payoffs, not truth, he came up with the next theory, which is called the interface theory of perception. This theory says, and again, I'm building a case now for you for what at the end is going to blow your mind, which is what is the reality that's hidden from us, okay? If you stick with me for this, you, we'll get to that, and then we're going to talk about that and go down that rabbit hole. That's the red pill. Once you hear it, you'll either think I'm crazy or you will see reality as very few humans have actually seen it, which is as it is. Okay, so listen to this. And again, the reason I get excited about this is it is the only thing that matters to me in the whole universe. Everything else are icons on a desktop interface. They matter for me to survive and to uh, reproduce and be successful in the world, but what really matters to me is the nature of the why and the what, what is actually going on. It's incredibly fascinating and it will change your outlook on everything. Okay, so the interface theory of perception says every species sees the world through an interface that it creates in real time from whatever is, exact, is, is actually in the world. So there is an objective reality. We're not making it up. We're not uh, hallucinating. We're interacting with a real reality that exists subjectively. That's why two people or 83 people live all agree that they see my face on a mug. Well, if the mug doesn't exist in reality, how can we all agree? This is why. Something exists here that we're all interacting with. We have a species-specific interface that allows us to see it as an icon. We share the same or similar interfaces because we all evolved on a similar path to fitness. Each of us shares the fact that this mug will probably do us good if it's filled with something we can drink. So we see it in a similar way. We share the Homo sapiens interface with the universe, which means this plant behind me, the camera, looks very similar to all of us. Does it look the same to all of us? Well, someone with green, red color blindness won't see that plant behind me as green. A mutant, one of the 4% of humans who encounter something called synesthesia, have a mutation in the interface where they see sounds or they feel tastes. This is evolution continuing to tinker with our interface. At some point in the future, natural selection might select for people who feel tastes. And then that becomes part of our interface. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution have shaped Homo sapien to see the world using the icons we use. We judge attractivity based on the ability to judge is a mate likely to be a successful host for a child, a successful father or mother? Are they healthy appearing? Would they be likely to protect the child? And these things are, made, are decided instantly based on our interface because the way that, say, men see women, they see these features as an icon and they make snap judgments. This is how advertising manipulates us. This is why magazines airbrush us. This is why facial symmetry is important because it tells us a fitness payoff, that this potential mate is healthier and more likely to be fertile and survive. So through our Homo sapiens interface, we interact with the world. Does that mean, well, let me back up for a second. What does a beetle in Africa, not Africa, in Australia, which is an example used in the book, what does a particular type of brown beetle, what's their interface? Are they conscious? Let's assume they are. How do they see the world? They see the world in terms of fitness payoffs for their species. How do we see them? As a beetle. How might they see a female, a, a male see a female of their, set, of their species? Completely differently. And this is a great example of how fitness beats truth. Well, 
That icon for that beetle evolved to see a brown, round, knobby thing as a female and go and mate with it. In Australia, it turns out, they had these beer bottles called stubbies, and Australians were just leaving them out in the desert after drinking. These beetles, male beetles, would look at this icon of the bottle, and it would see not only a female, but the sexiest, hottest, most desirable female they've ever seen, because that beer bottle hacked its interface. It looked, for all intents and purposes, to the male beetle like a female, and these beetles would mate with this bottle until they died. And the beetle almost went extinct until Australians changed the look of their bottles to avoid this. That is more information that tells us our interface doesn't show truth, it hides truth. It shows fitness. In that case, the environment, natural selection, had changed faster than the beetle's interface could adapt. So the beetle tried to have sex with the bottle and would have gone extinct. If it had millions of years to evolve, it would have, mutations in the beetle's interface would have occurred over generations, and it would have seen the difference between a bottle and a female mate. So each species has a species-specific interface, and that's called the interface theory of perception. So, what are other things that make us wonder about, hmm, could reality be weirder and more like the interface theory of perception than we think? Well, if you look at science, science was really good at predicting a lot of stuff, and it made a lot of sense if you assumed a physical basis of reality that this exists even whether or not humans exist. In other words, there was a Big Bang without humans, and it existed as exactly that. And electrons and the position of my table and my jacket in space exist even if no conscious entity observes them. And that's what science actually had said early on, at least it was consistent with scientific theories, because we could explain most of the universe based on real physical objects existing in space and time. Then Einstein comes up with general relativity, which says space and time are one thing, and objects um, uh, have to obey certain things, like they, they don't propagate information faster than the speed of light, and so on and so forth. But then something interesting happened. Quantum mechanics became a thing. Now, quantum mechanics says some crazy shit, and it turns out that stuff has been shown time and time again to be true by experiment. And what does it say? It says that Objects do not assume a position, momentum, or mass, charge, and spin. None of those things exist when they are unobserved. What does that mean? It means that objects don't exist in space and time as such until they are observed. And it turns out when science tries to unify relativity and quantum mechanics, it falls apart. Because now science has pushed up against our, the limits of our interface. Our interface said these objects exist in space and time, and space and time uh, are real. They exist absolutely. Whereas Hoffman says, no, space-time is our desktop. We spin it up in real time. Our minds create it in order to make sense of reality in a way that allows us to reproduce. Space and time and objects do not exist as such. And quantum mechanics actually is consistent with this. So now you go, wait, so hold on. There's a big problem here. We can't reconcile quantum mechanics and relativity. We can't reconcile quantum mechanics with our physicalist intuition that objects exist when they are not looked at. The moon exists when you don't look at it as a moon. No, it doesn't. Quantum mechanics says it doesn't, and the interface theory of perception says the moon only exists as an icon when we look at it, and we tend to agree that it looks like a moon because we share the same interface. But when we look away, the moon, as this big thing of rock and all that, doesn't exist because the icon goes poof, because we're not creating it. Something exists there that we're interacting with, but it is most certainly not the moon as a rock.
Wait, what? Bear with me a second. Here's another big failure of current science to determine the nature of reality. So, okay, objects exist in space and time. What is a neuron? It's an object that exists in space and time. A bunch of neurons create a brain. A brain creates consciousness, right? Hmm, how? So, most people don't think about this on a daily basis, but I do, because I'm weird. How is it that electrical signals in the brain, irritation of nervous tissue, no matter how complex, how does that spin up my felt experience of the taste of black coffee? How does that spin up the feeling, the felt experience of an emotion? This is where you have to invoke a miracle because there is we are not even close. We can explain the neural correlates of consciousness. We can say this part of the brain lights up when this kind of feeling happens, but we cannot explain how a brain creates consciousness at all. There are some hand-waving theories, but they don't make any sense, and this is called the hard problem of consciousness. In other words, this problem of how does matter emerge awareness, nobody knows. So the religious people say it's God, it's the Holy Spirit. The physicalists say, well, we're just not smart enough to figure it out. Some people even have this idea of panpsychism, which says, well, every piece of matter also has a property of consciousness. It's just part of the universe, and so this thing is conscious, just not that conscious, and as it combines into brains, it's more conscious, but then the question of how, and that's crazy, comes up. So we're stumped, and the more we struggle with this, the more we struggle, science struggles with. How do we do the quantum mechanics explanation? What the hell is that? What's going on with consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness? And how come we're, we're running up against a wall? And this is where Hoffman says, well, interface theory of per perception says you're not seeing reality. A neuron does not exist when it's not perceived by a human interface. A neuron is an icon on a desktop that exists on the desktop of space and time, but it's not real in and of itself. It points to something in reality. But it itself, and this is where I want you to listen very carefully, a neuron, physical objects on our desktop, do not have causal powers. What that means is a neuron doesn't in itself do anything. It is our icon on our desktop of reality. What does that mean? You can move icons around, you can manipulate icons in predictable ways and force reality to do something interesting. That's how a computer works. If I move a Word document to the trash and click delete, I've used this icon in a space-time desktop I've created to accomplish something. That data goes bye-bye. Did, did those icons actually make that happen? Did the moving of the icon actually cause this to happen? No, it simply pointed to the underlying reality of zeros and ones and transistors that caused something to change. That's how reality is under Hoffman's interface theory of perception. The reason we can't figure out, medicine has run up against a wall figuring out how the brain actually emerges consciousness and this has relevance to depression and anxiety and PTSD and all the ways we're treating it with these molecules like serotonin inhibitors and you know, you know, um, olanzapine, these little chemical molecules, is because the molecules themselves have no causal power. The neurons don't cause anything to happen. It is simply our interface. And what happens when we run up against the limits of our interface? And now we can move the icons around, but we're like monkeys just throwing you know, bananas around. We have no idea what's underlying those icons, and that's why we fail. Because what's underlying the icons has causal power. 
And when we understand how to manipulate that, then we change everything, everything. All of medicine, all of philosophy, all of spirituality, all of science will be transformed. Now, if this sounds hyperbolic, it probably is, but wait till I get to the punchline. So, bear with me this. There's the theory of reality now that's based on physicalism, that there was a big bang and physical matter spun up and then a miracle happened. Life and emergent consciousness occurred. The miracle happens late in the theory. Here's what Hoffman is proposing. And it, it's based on the work of Leibniz and Immanuel Kant and many others, Plato, that he stands on the shoulders of, but his is the first time a scientific theory of this comes into play. Physicalism assumes something that philosophers call a dualism. And I'm going to go back and look through your comments at the end of this podcast, so keep leaving them, okay? Because I see them streaming. Um, physicalism assumes a dualism, which is that there's physical matter that emerges consciousness and that there's a subject, our consciousness, that perceives objects, the world. And that's a dualism. There are two things. And you have to emerge a miracle to how consciousness emerges. What Hoffman says is, okay, grant me that evolution blinded us to the truth of the real, what's really going on in the universe, and that objects don't exist in space and time. Those are icons that we spin up, that we create and destroy as we perceive the world. So what is the nature of the universe? And he says this, instead of starting with matter, emerging consciousness, what if you do the simplest thing in the world? Start with consciousness. And you would say, well, wait, how can consciousness be the pre-existing fabric of the universe? That sounds crazy. How can matter be the pre-existing substrate of the universe? Where did that come from? What's crazier? That out of space and time, because that's an illusion that we create, it's a substrate we create, there's always been consciousness, and that's the substrate of the universe, awareness. And from that, we spin up space, time, objects, relativity, quantum mechanics, all the scientific theories, and everything. Starting instead of with matter, starting with consciousness. Then you don't have to emerge a miracle late in your theory. You grant one miracle, which is consciousness is all there's been from the beginning. And then from that, consciousness evolves over time evolves interfaces, and the currency of consciousness is experience. So, this is where we get into the matrix. I'm gonna give you the red pill now, like Hoffman gave me. Hoffman's theory is called the theory of conscious realism. And this is what it says. Instead of vibrating strings or quarks or whatever you wanna take the smallest substrate of the universe to be, the universe is made up of conscious agents. What is a conscious agent? A conscious agent, in substitute quark or st vibrating string or whatever that physical thing that you thought it was, substitute instead a conscious agent. A conscious agent is simply a little piece of awareness, and again, we're using we're using physical terms to describe something that's not physical, so you have to bear with me. It doesn't make sense when you look at it from a physicalist perspective, but we have to use this language because we don't have the language in our interface of Homo sapiens to describe this well. But what we do have is math, and that's a universal language, so bear with me. The smallest conscious agent is simply a unit of awareness that is able to do three things. It is able to perceive the world around it. It is able to have this experience, right? That's what consciousness is, the ability to 
have an experience, an internal experience that results from perceptions of the outside world. It's able to have that experience. It's able to make a decision. So it can do this or do this, depending on how complex it is. And then it's able to act on the world around it. And so this conscious agent exists not in a vacuum, but in a vast, infinite network of other conscious agents that, by the way, are outside of space and time because space and time is a construct we create. It's this vast, infinite network of conscious agents interacting and combining to form higher level conscious agents all the way up to infinity and down to the smallest conscious agent there is, which is a, like a one-bit conscious agent that has two experiences. That's it maybe on or off, yes or no. And it acts on other one-bit conscious agents. And when those conscious agents, they have their, it's called PDA, perceive, decide, act. That's what these things do. When they interact with themselves, this can be described mathematically. And Hoffman lays this out in his other work and in the appendix of his book, The Case Against, the Re Case Against Reality. These PDA loops, form something in mathematics called a Markovian kernel. Don't worry about that stuff. But they are basically mathematical descriptions of how perception, decision, and action affect each other in a conscious agent world. And it turns out that the mathematics actually shows that these conscious agents, when you get two conscious agents that are exchanging experience with each other. So in other words, my perception is simply what the other conscious agent fed me in the form of their action. So all of reality is simply the exchange of experience between conscious agents of increasing complexity. So when two conscious agents are tight in experiential sharing, they actually mathematically form a third higher conscious agent that has its own sets of experiences that are partially influenced by the agents within it. And when those higher experience conscious agents um, exchange experience with other conscious agents in this infinite network, they form higher conscious agents. Now, this is getting like, right? So let's slow down for a second. I'm gonna rehash everything I've said just very quickly. Instead of assuming the world is made of physical objects that exist in space and time, start with the assumption that the world is really conscious agents interacting with each other in an infinite network. As these individual conscious agents, which can perceive, decide, and act on the world, and the world is just other conscious agents, combine to form increasingly complex conscious agents, which are what they call higher instance, instantiations. So if you imagine like there's an instance of a cup right here, there's an instance of ZDOG MD, this is my instantiation. That means that at this level, I am aware I have a certain levels, certain number of experiences I'm capable of having, certain number of decisions I'm capable of making, and certain number of actions I'm capable of performing on the outside world, which exists in the form of other conscious agents that I perceive through my own interface as icons that help me survive and reproduce in this vast social network of consciousness, competing and interacting with itself and evolving over time. And the entire universe and all our perceptions are simply consciousness perceiving itself and interacting with itself in a vast social network. And as such, what is a human mind? Well, when we cut it open, so let's solve the hard problem of consciousness right now. When you cut open a brain and you see this goo and you look at it, this is what we see. Actually, hold on. Let me back up for a second. Does this make any sense at all? Or is everyone just going, what the fuck is he talking about? Maybe. Um, but let me back up a second. I'm a very complex conscious agent made up of 
a whole bunch of nested conscious agents that are in, of increasing complexity underneath me. And there's all kinds of arguments, and I want you to read Hoffman's last chapter in his book on conscious agents to go through this in depth. But the argument is, well, that doesn't even make sense. Like, what are you talking about? How, how does this even make sense? Let me put it in some terms that might be understandable. So look in a mirror. Because the argument, the question is, and again, I'm having trouble explaining this because it's very, it, it's so intuitively correct that I want to make sure I get it right. So z Dog, what you're telling me is that an electron is a conscious agent and that an electron has experience. And to that I say, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the electron is an icon in the Homo sapiens interface that points to a conscious agent or series of nested conscious agents with which I am interacting, with, with that interact with themselves to form higher level conscious agents that I, I then interact with. When I look at this little microphone stand, it is a series of atoms and quarks and electrons which each point to some conscious agent. I just see it as this because in order to survive, my interface has limited ability to perceive reality, which is all these conscious agents. So it, so it shows me this because this I can deal with as a conscious agent. I can get through, reproduce, be alive, and be successful by seeing this as a microphone stand. The same thing goes with other humans. If you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see a face and eyes and skin and all this. And so you see an icon. How do you know it's an icon? Because you know what is actually under the surface. Under the surface of this icon that you see in the mirror is all the deep myriad of conscious experience that you are having even at this moment. The sights, the sounds, the perceptions, the thoughts, the feelings, the dreams, everything that you are in this vast nested consciousness exists. But when you look in the mirror, you see an icon in in time and space. Why? Because if you actually saw what existed, you would go insane. You don't have the processing power as a conscious agent. You don't have the vastness of experience and ability to actually see what's really going on. So we create an interface that allows us to do okay. So let's take that to the next level. If you cut open a head and you look at a brain, what do you see? Goo. And we go, that's a brain. I know that that generates consciousness, right? So you cut it up further and you actually look at neurons. Okay, neurons, I can get that, I can get that. I understand something. And in fact, in fact, in fact, back up a second. When you look at other humans and you see their icons and they smile at you or they give you a look that says, I like you, or they give you a look of fear, you immediately get a glimpse at the underlying conscious state. Why? Because you know what it's like to be you and you can create a theory of mind from their icon. So we evolved to look at other humans and see icons that allow us to get a little bit into their heads because that helps us be social creatures and be successful evolutionarily. Now what happens when you look at the icon that represents a dog? You see, you can kind of get some sense. You can be like, oh, it's happy, it's unhappy, it's anxious, it's angry. But can you really dig into what's going on in that dog's head? The way it basically sees smells in a way that humans can't. The way it sees a female dog or a male dog as a mate, you don't see that. It sees this beautiful object that it wants. But we don't get that sense from the dog, but we just get enough from its icon. Go down lower to an ant. You see, and we assume a dog is conscious. Go down to an ant. When we see that icon, that icon 
represents a consciousness, a set of conscious agents that is so foreign to us, that is so different in its ability to have experiences and its experiences, that we can't even imagine what it's experiencing. So much so that we assume it has no experience and that it's just a robot. But that's wrong. We look at the icon the best we can using our species-specific interface, but it was never in evolution's interest for us to understand the inner mind state of an ant. Now take it one step lower. A rock. You see a rock and you see it as an interface. Or you see this mug. At this point, our ability to understand what conscious agent this icon is pointing to is nil. And so we assume it is not at all representing anything alive or aware. And what Hoffman is saying is that's just the limit of our interface. Everything is made of awareness. There are no objects existing outside of consciousness. Consciousness is all there is an experience Sharing experience in a vast social network of conscious agents is the currency of the realm. And these conscious agents evolve over time by competing in this vast social network to exchange information and experience with each other and get more and more complex experientially. And just in the same way that we cannot imagine the experience of a new color that we've never perceived, we can't even imagine it because our interface limits us. So too can we not even imagine the conscious experience that is pointed to by the icon of this. And thinking of it in terms of, oh, does it feel pain? Does it do that? It's not even the right way to think about this. It is entirely something beyond our ability to experience. But that doesn't mean that it's not there having an experience. And so as a result, we don't see reality as it is. We see it as icons. What reality actually is, is a series of conscious agents all interacting with themselves and nesting up into infinite complexity. And so now let's get even weirder for a second. Um, <laughs> uh, these comments are amazing. So, <clears throat> it turns out that you can use the same principles of science that we use on physical objects to describe conscious agents. You can use math and you can use predictive uh, math and this would then lead us to certain theories and certain predictions. We can, with hard work, spin up predictive models that test whether, starting with conscious agents, we can spin up a desktop of space, time, quantum gravity, and a grand unified theory of everything. And that just takes hard work, diligence, and a lot of scientists working hard. It can be done, but it won't be done if we don't ask the right question, if we don't start with the right premise. For most of our history, we've been misled to believe that physical objects and space-time are real and that they spin up consciousness. Start the other way and spin up reality based on conscious agents and it can be done. And so that's the next stage of the research that Hoffman's looking at. Now let's bring it to something that we can definitely understand, maybe. Uh, and this is where, again, I'm gonna lose people. Um, Think about your own experience. Psychologists will tell you most of what we experience, most of our decisions, most of our mind function is unconscious. When I talk about elephant and rider, when I talk about emotions, the elephant, the unconscious, hopes, dreams, fears, snap decisions, using primitive heuristics to make decisions quickly based on stereotype and shorthand, that's most of our brain. Only in the last few million years have we evolved the little rider who rides on top of the elephant. In Hoffman's conception of conscious agents, the conscious mind, the mind that experiences currently, 
that is slow to make decisions, that does math and strategizes and speaks and does things that are complicated and slow, what Daniel Kahneman calls, calls system two thinking. If you haven't read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, you should read it. It's basically Elephant and the Writer spun into psychology and economics. That level of consciousness is our awake consciousness. It is our highest level conscious agent that we have access to currently. In other words, it's our current instantiation made up by all the lower level conscious agents that add up to form us. And at this level of consciousness, at this instantiation of consciousness, we are aware of the world, we make decisions we think, we interact with our world around us, we love and we hope and we, and we um, act. But where do those decisions come up from? What is the rest of that brain? It's all the underlying conscious agents that we call our unconscious. So the unconscious part of our mind that does work in the background, the elephant, system one in Kahneman's thinking, the elephant in John Haidt's model, is actually conscious at its own level of instantiation. It is having conscious experience. It's just that we don't access that unless we do drugs or have brain damage, etc. And here is one of the most concrete examples that, that Hoffman gives in his book. In patients who've had their corpus callosum cut, in other words, you have the two hemispheres of the brain and that fibrous tract that runs between it, there are reasons, epilepsy, focal epilepsy, to have that cut called a callosotomy. The, the, the data shows that you now have created two independent conscious agents that often disagree with one another, that run different sides of the body, and you can access them by addressing one side or the other. And I, I recommend you read his book to get the deets on this, but it is these are classical experiments. And so let's parse this through our conscious agent theory. When we look at a brain, we see an icon, meat. We see another icon, corpus callosum, a little meat bridge between these two pieces of meat. But what are we seeing? We are seeing icons that point to conscious agent one, conscious agent two, and maybe some connection they have through some other conscious agent stuff. When you use a scalpel and cut that, we don't know what a scalpel points to some other kind of conscious agent. It it revokes the common instantiation that these two agents share, where they're able to act in collusion at a higher level. This is now broken down. They now have two separate experiences that alternate, and they don't collude as well as they did before. And so something, in their, something weakens their common instantiation. And our unconscious mind is nested like this. We have an emotional mind that is a conscious agent that's nested under that, and a thinking mind that is nested under that, and all these serve us up information in our current instantiation. So what is free will? Free will is the give and take between what these conscious agents underneath us are freely deciding and serving up to us and constraining what our high-level conscious agent is deciding to do. So sometimes you just want chocolate. And you're like, I want chocolate. Well, who is this I? Well, there's a bunch of underlying conscious agents that decide, I want chocolate, and they serve it up. And then you have not so much free will as free won't. You decide, I'm gonna do this or I'm not. And that's the override. So you are conditioned and constrained by your underlying conscious agents, but you also condition and constrain the conscious agents underneath inside your instan instantiation. That's what learning is. That's what hanging out with smart people does. It reconditions your unconscious mind, which now we know is just a series of nested conscious agents. And we transform ourselves and evolve over time. And to me, this is fascinating because what is mental illness? Dysfunctional underlying conscious agents interacting with each other and exchanging bad experience in a way that's malproductive. What is PTSD? 
damage through experience, experience, which is the currency of the realm, damage through experience to a series of nested underlying conscious agents that make up our instantiation of consciousness that now causes dysfunction where we are unable to interact with the social network of conscious agents without panic, fear, whatever cortisol represents, these kind of things. And if we understand that, now we can create therapy that's very different by manipulating conscious agents themselves rather than just the icons, which are the limits of our perception. None of this makes any sense, but it makes perfect sense to me, and that's all that matters. Now it's time to read some comments. Um, ah, complete heart block of the mind, Beth Marie, 44, and that's, that's what we need. Complete heart block of the mind. That's what the cutting of the corpus callosum is. And so now you have two conscious agents that are free to be themselves, which is weird because the right hand will, will disagree with what the left brain is saying. It's crazy stuff. Um, William Tillman says, um, this is also a scalable phenomenon in the same way that a body is made up of semi-independent cells, a population is made up of semi-independent persons. William Tillman, thank you for this. This is what I forgot to say. All right. Here's the piece where I explain God. Okay, bear with me. Just as we are an instantiation of our unconscious, conscious, aid, unconscious to us, we don't access them, except through sometimes through meditation, you can access your unconscious and through therapy and things like that. But in general waking life, we don't have the processor ability within our interface to access our unconscious. If the universe is all consciousness, then that means we are conscious agents within a even higher instantiation. Have you ever been to a concert where everybody's heads are bobbing in unison and everybody is feeling and connected to the musician in a common way and there's almost a feeling of oneness with everybody there? What do you think that is? That's all of the underlying conscious agents exchanging a common experience and emerging a higher instantiation of conscious agent. Imagine if Earth is a higher level conscious agent that we cannot even imagine what its experience is. In fact, all we see it as is this dumbed down icon of rock and dirt and people and this and that. That's all we can see through our monkey interface. But in reality, it is this vastly rich experience that then exchanges experience with the planets in the solar system that then exchanges experience with the galaxy that's really just a neuron in some higher forms interface and it goes on and on into infinity upwards and down to the one bit conscious agent which explains why the universe from all scientific um, uh, uh, realization so far seems to be pixelated it seems to have a smallest aspect the Planck length. And that is the pixels on our desktop interface. Well, reality may well be made of conscious agent pixels that go up into infinity. So what is God? God is an infinite conscious agent that has experience beyond which we could ever imagine that conditions us as an underlying conscious agent, but does not directly control or even have full access to our minds but we are part of God and God is part of us. And if you look at it that way, whoo, huh? that means we could in theory have even scientific predictive models of how these experiential entities might exist. And all of the great mystical spiritual traditions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, mystical Christianity, mystical Islam like Sufi Islam, uh, they all, mystical Judaism, all point to this monism, this oneness that everything is what they would call spirit, what we are calling awareness, as the fundamental reality 
that is. And, and we can actually apply science to it. So we don't have to be spooky and mystical and new agey. We can go, yeah, we're gonna take the same scientific principles that misled us into thinking physicalism was real and apply them to the monism, the singleism of everything is conscious agents. And let's see if we can spin up a reality that makes sense using that. All right, let's read some of this. And see, Beth Marie 44 says, boom, the scalable component is what gets me. It's so good. I have done a lot of public speaking. And there are times when I'm on stage when there is a flow state between audience and speaker. And actually, they've done some studies, I think, where they've looked at EEGs and noticed that people's brainwave uh, oscillations actually synchronize when they're in those sort of collective flow states where they're all around a single topic sharing experience. And I look out at the audience and I see them and they look like this. And I'm looking at them like this, telling them this. And I've lost a sense of self entirely. We are one thing in that moment. And you wonder whether that's our monkey interface way of accessing the next level above. And it makes you really think that the meaning of life is really the meaning within life. It's us exchanging experience with others and the world around us. And when we're isolated, when we feel deconnected from that vast social network, when we involute into our own mind and our own nested instantiation without connecting to the higher, we find ourselves with pathology of isolation, depression, social isolation, suicidality. And then you can speculate what happens when we die, and that's speculation, but what if we just unplug from the human interface? We, our current level of instantiation decomposes into its underlying parts, but nothing is created nor destroyed. Uh, and isn't that interesting? Hmm. Let's see. William Tillman, uh, I agree that from a cosmic nihilist perspective, there's no true meaning. So this is interesting. I think I find meaning in understanding reality and the fact that connection, uh, love, for lack of a better term, is the highest purpose of reality if it's all consciousness. It's all interacting with itself. Why not try to create well-being, good experiences, and alleviate suffering for as much of it and yourself as we can? By the way, understand that we can't know our underlying unconscious elements that are conscious, our underlying conscious agents, very well because we don't have the processing capacity, which is why therapists are still in business. Knowing ourself is a really hard thing to do. Knowing others is a hard thing to do. But we can still try. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, uh, let's see. Um, Risa Duby, I find meaning in connection with others. So do I. That's why I'm here. Why would I do this? I mean, I feel like sometimes I'll listen to Hoffman speak or read his book, and I will get this tingling insight that, Wow, that is actually the nature of things. And then I'm like, I have to share this with every single person I can because it's the connection that creates the purpose. It's the meaning within life. What is our purpose in this instantiation? Is it good? Is it connected? Is it something that is going to make this vast social network of experience better? than when I started. That's the meaning within life. That's why we're here together connecting in the middle of a work week together, sharing this experience. And it sounds crazy, my friends. And believe me, I am not the type of person to say shit like this. But the older I get, the more experiences I have, you know, having kids, having this weird movement that we have that's really based on a shared connection has transformed my thinking. Um, William Tillman, a psychopath, in a certain sense, has low emotional intelligence. Actually, so yes. So imagine what a psychopath's interface is like. They don't have the nested conscious agent that's functional that serves up emotional intelligence or 
empathy or these kind of things. But yet, most psycho, many psychopaths are able to read other people's icons and manipulate them because they're able to have a cognitive empathy. They're able to understand based on the icon what that person feels and what their inner life is like and manipulate it because they don't have the underlying conscious agency that says you need to be good to people and treat others like you would want to be treated. And um, psychopaths are an interesting study. People who've had their corpus callosum severed are an interesting study. People who are synesthetes, who experience the world through a different interface, are an interesting study. And then there are human organisms who can help decode the interface of relative organisms. So primates, we share 99 point some odd percent of our DNA with them. DNA is an icon, of course, that points to something else. It's whatever the heritable aspect of conscious agency is. And yet, despite sharing this with chimps, say, or gorillas, when we look at their icon, we really have trouble understand, understanding their conscious life inside because the icons are so different and their experience is so different from ours. And we didn't evolve to understand what an ape is thinking. It doesn't matter that much to us. So what does somebody like Jane Goodall do? She's gifted. She's some kind of mutant. She looks at their interface, looks at the icon of the monkey and is able to glean, much like a psychopath can glean, what the inner life of that monkey is like and therefore predict its behavior in the real world in a way that enlightened all of us. Now, you could say she's the monkey whisperer, just like you know Cesar, what's his name, is the dog whisperer. He's able to see into the inner life of dogs past our limited icon. Maybe his iconography is different. Maybe he just has a better sense of reading that. So it's really fascinating. Um, let's see. <laughs> Zelda Richards. Well, there goes the Z-Dog 2020 campaign. Joke. I only wish that someone this insightful might take on the challenge. The Office of President, much like the medical institution, isn't suited to nuance and complexity. It's true. And the thing is, you got to understand that, that if you're still watching this, all right, you are an outlier uh, in the, if you take a bell curve of human population, maybe 1%, and this has kind of been looked at actually, 1% is on the leading edge of, oh, this stuff interests me. I care about this and I can wrap my head around it, not because I'm smarter, but because I've gone through these stages, almost like Maslow's, where Okay, I did organized religion. I, oh, I did magical thinking. I did organized religion. I did atheism. I did pluralism, the sort of uh, sense that we're all hippies trying to like live in this ecosphere. And then I transcended that and realized, well, that wasn't complete either. And now I'm looking for the next emergent truth. And it turns out there are other people who are looking for the same thing. And that 1% is, it, you know, it drives conversations like what we try to have. And that's why you guys are here. Um, so let's see, um, Daniel Sorborn says, we're outliers and we're okay with that, exactly. And Daniel, I think, is kind of an interesting expert in this merging of science and spirituality, uh, if I'm recalling correctly. And um, you know, this is the other thing. So now you can have, and this is what Hoffman's looking at, a science of spirituality using the conscious agent theory and the math behind it. And by the way, the math is impressive and very hard to understand. Markovian kernels, these are new techniques and very hairy, uh, and they involve probabilities. Uh, it, it gets complicated the more complex the conscious agent is, but it's not impossible. And with quantum computers coming up and this kind of thing, we might be able to actually delve into these issues. Um, Let's see, uh, let's scroll back and see some other comments and then we'll let you guys go if we can here. Susan Anderson, protect yourself from negative and adverse consciousnesses and connect with those that resonate with us. Yes, Suzanne, but don't, uh, don't end up in an echo chamber because that doesn't allow your instantiation to grow. And think about it this way, when you are in a room with your favorite people or your favorite colleagues and you're interacting and you're exchanging experience, a kind of oneness occurs that emerges 
a higher sort of conscious agent. And if you think about nations, nations share a certain shared fiction, whether it's the Constitution, whether it's, you know, whatever the European um, Union's parliament says or their constitution, there's a shared kind of idea that might emerge this higher instantiation. I think we should strive for a mix because every conscious creature is in tension between communion with this higher level, communion with its lower instantiations of itself, in other words, understanding itself, and then straight autonomy of I am me, step off. And it's finding the balance between those tensions that makes for philosophy and poetry and fiction and art and all the beautiful things um, that, we, that we create as humans. Um, Ashley Stewart says, I have to admit that the math went right over my head in the appendix in the book. Yes, Ashley, you and me both. Markovian kernels, I don't understand. Mathematicians do, and, and Donald Hoffman, I think, understands it. And I've read Donald's primary papers, and I'll tell you, when he gets into the math, you're just like, shit, I'm gonna have to trust you, bro, because that is insane. Uh, it's truly insane. Um, let's read some more comments. Um, William Tillman Z, this type of stuff needs to be a recurring segment on your channel. I volunteer as tribute to help. William Tillman, email me, zubin at turntablehealth.com, Z-U-B-I-N. Uh, message me and tell me, because it says here, this type of stuff is literally what you're devoting your career to. I wanna hear from you, I wanna have you enlighten me, because I'm learning about this stuff. I have a lot of Dunning-Kruger around this, but l l let me tell you guys one, one, one final thing. Um, if all I did with my show was this, uh, from now on, I would be so happy. It would be all that I would do, and then we'd have fun on the side. I wouldn't have to talk about the horrible scourge of like violence against healthcare providers. I wouldn't have to talk about how do we fix uh, uh, healthcare, how do we uh, improve primary care and present, prevent disease. I would just talk about this and then from this would trickle down all the answers we need. That would be an ideal world, but I know that's not possible. So I came to YouTube for this because I feel like it's a kind of a push scenario where you guys who really care about this will find this content uh, and it'll come into your feed and you'll join me for these recurring talks. We'll come up with a name for it, I don't know, something stupid like Z philosophy, God knows what it is. Conscious Zism. I don't know. It's stupid. You guys will come up with it, um, and we'll keep doing it. Um, actually, let me look at this real quick. Scott Johnston. In Christian Trinitarian theology, God is complete in perfect union of three persons, a community of infinite, perfect love and knowledge, mutually given and received. Human persons are invited in. So Scott, let's un unpack that Christian theology for a second. And I went through a phase where I just despised all organized religion, and I'm well transcended that phase now. I actually feel like um, they're all pointing to a similar truth. The, the, what you just said perfectly summarizes and is summarized by the theory of conscious agents. If God is a union of three infinite conscious agents in this theology, and they're inviting the lower instantiations to participate in an incomplete way, but in a way that is, again, in their instantiation, perfect connection, perfect relationship, perfect inclusion, and perfect love. Love is connection. Love is sharing experience. Love is deep connection with other consciousness. Um, that's a beautiful thing, bro. And however you access that, whatever icon you use, because remember, we're all just using icons, it's brilliant. The only thing I would say is if we're clinging to our ancient literal view of texts, that if we're clinging to those icons and the understanding behind them without seeing the deeper truth, we're gonna harm each other, we're gonna create conflict, and we're gonna imperfectly understand the nature of these things. If we can transcend in a way that you point to, uh, I think all the religions 
are saying ultimately on that deep spiritual level the same exact thing, including the atheists who are asking for a scientific explanation of reality, which this is. Guys, this was fun. Like we always had 70 to 80 people with us. That's crazy. That's like a classroom full of philosophers. <laughs> so anyways, watch me share this on YouTube and no one, I mean on Facebook and no one will watch it, but keep coming back. Let's keep doing this. Tell me what I can do better uh, in the comments after the show is over. Uh, because those comments everyone can easily see. These comments, in order to see them, you have to like activate the super chat or whatever the hell it is on YouTube. Um, and check out the podcast that I did. Okay, check this out. Go to ZDogMD.com. I'll put a link in the description. And search Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N. Go to the web post I did with him and don't listen to us talk. Read the transcript. Uh, I reviewed it this morning and was like, oh shit, that was a good discussion. About halfway through, it gets into conscious realism and it gets crazy deep. So if you want a better structured conversation of this, please go there and check it out. If you want to come and hang out and share experience in a way that's even more immediate, join our supporter tribe. Tribe. I know it's $4.99 a month, but the reason it's great is it keeps the riffraff out. And uh, it's a really great crew. A lot of times I'll wake up at like 7 a.m., I'll go in my backyard and we'll just have like meditation rounds where we'll talk about shit and talk about this stuff. And so it's a good place to be. It's also a way you can support what we do. But it's more in- I'm more interested in that it's a good place to connect. Um, and I, oh, look, uh, give us topics to study ahead of time. I will try, Callie, on the community page on YouTube. I'll try to give you guys a heads up on what I'm talking about if I can think of it. I'm kind of spontaneous that way. Like I, I got up this morning and I'm like, I want to talk about consciousness. God damn it. Um, I love you guys and we out. Peace.